good morning again. Um, I'm just out here been coming out here in the morning to read my Bible and pray and um, maybe just going to do some devotions. I am going to do the Heidelberg Catechism some again, but I was thinking about another uh, really important passage of scripture that I think would be really helpful to a lot of people at church and probably just to a lot of people in general um, who are followers of Christ. And uh, it's the book of Job and specifically the opening chapter. There is a there's a line from this that uh, really hit me. That's probably a couple years ago. I preached a, a special sermon on on this passage called that I called "Does Job Fear God for Nothing?" And Job chapter one, we know that uh, Job was a, a godly man. He was a, a righteous man, blameless and upright. He he feared God and he shunned evil. And he had seven sons and three daughters. It's, it's interesting. His uh, his ten kids were just the opposite of mine because I have seven daughters and three sons. And he had lots of possessions. And he uh, his kids, you know, had feasts at each other's houses. And life was pretty good. Life was pretty good. And Job was deeply concerned spiritually uh, about his children. And um, he he uh, offered sacrifices for them. Um, I just I, this is the shirt that I grabbed in my room in the dark. Um, my my kids got me this for Father's Day. Regular dad trying not to to raise liberals. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, to any of my uh, new liberal uh, watchers, it's true. Um, not not that I'm against uh, free thinking and having an open mind. Um, your your open mind needs to be uh, contained at least by something. Um, like by, by the word of God, by the truth. Um, and so we want to be open-minded, uh, but not so open-minded that our brains fall out of our skulls, which is what I'm trying not to produce with my children. I'm trying to teach them how, how to think um, instead of having them listen to the world around them, which will tell them not how to think, but what to think. And um, because the children growing up in our culture are so used to thinking that assertions or arguments uh, they actually find it convincing when someone says something like uh, Jesus stepped off of a UFO 2,000 years ago really yeah yeah okay I'll, I'll believe that then and a lot of the young people just believe whatever they're told um, if, if an authority figure of some kind tells them to believe it they'll believe it and that's what I'm trying not to produce and uh, I was actually talking to my kids last night I will get to Job here just a second uh, we were talking about um, when I was in college, and the thing that, that really helped me the most in, in college was I read the Bible a lot. Uh, when I was converted, when I was 18, I would read the Bible every evening in my college dorm room. We didn't have a TV. We didn't have anything for entertainment. Um, so I just read my Bible all the time. And because of that, because my mind was filled with, with Scripture, when my liberal professors, and all of them were liberals uh, at Ohio University. There's 23,000 students at that campus. I was there from 1993 to 1997. When they, when they said anything about the Bible or about the Christian faith, I could tell when I was 18, 19, 20, and 21 years old that they were as ignorant of the text of Scripture and of the Christian faith as they could possibly be. Um, and I knew that they didn't know what they were talking about because I knew the text of scripture well enough to know what they just said is wrong. What they just said doesn't make any sense. What they just said is not true. What they just said is not taught in scripture. And I, I don't think I ever heard uh, an even semi-factual statement made by a professor about Christianity. And it also hit me that professors who have no expertise in the realm of theology uh, church history, historical theology, um, the Bible, Greek, Hebrew, exegesis, any of that, should probably stick to their narrow fields of specialized science or specialized expertise um, and not pretend to know something about what they are, in fact, completely ignorant of. Uh, so I've told the kids, if you know the text of Scripture really well, you will never be misled by anything. You'll never be misled by anything. And uh, that's one reason uh, that I've responded so strongly to the rise of LGBTism uh, is because uh, when the Bible speaks of uh, fornicators and idolaters and extortioners, revilers, thieves and swindlers and homosexuals and effeminate, 
Um, it's not describing states of being. It's not describing a fixed and unchanging category of human personhood. It's just describing human behavior. That's all. Just human behavior. And 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 is actually very, it's a very encouraging and very simple passage. Uh, he's talking about the Corinthian believers, the sins that they had been saved from, that they had been saved from slavery to. And he says, such were some of you. You guys used to behave like this too. He wasn't saying that um, the terms that are used there, thief, what, what, what is a thief? A thief is someone who steals a lot. <clears throat> That's all. It's just someone who steals a lot. Um, you're not describing that person's ontology. You're not describing a fixed category of their personhood that they can never change or repent of <clears throat> or anything like that. Okay. What is a, a swindler? What is an extortioner? What is a fornicator? Those are individuals who do those things a lot. That's all. What's a homosexual? It's not describing orientation. There, there's no such thing as orientation. Uh, in scripture, it's not a category of human person that it doesn't exist. Okay. So it's important that people realize um, when people try to turn certain sins into having a special status or something that there's no warrant whatsoever to do that. None at all. Okay, so if you know the text of scripture really well, you will never be misled by anything. Okay, and so we need to be a generation of Bible readers again. That's what I've tried to teach the kids. Um, you need to be in the word of God uh, every day. We had a really good devotion last night, and my, my two older ones that still uh, are at home with us um, were asking, you know, how can we make that habit? And I encouraged them, you know, when I was first saved... Um, I had a certain time of the day that I got up every day for class and I just started setting my uh, alarm 15 minutes earlier. And so 15 minutes, I mean, you can accomplish a lot in 15 minutes. You can um, pray uh, for the day and pray against the sin you struggle with uh, and read three or four or five chapters of the Bible and just move the little, you know, if you have the, um, the bookmarks that are built into your Bible, great. If you have little sticky tabs or whatever, I have lots of sticky tabs in my Bible, um, use those. Okay, so you need to be in the Word of God. If you're, if you know the text of Scripture, you will, you will not be led astray by the not, not the arguments because there are no arguments, but by the assertions that are made by our culture about what's true and what's not true. And for the most part, those are just statements of complete and total ignorance of what the text of Scripture actually does say. Okay, now I want to talk about the Book of Job here real quick. Job chapter one, verse six. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Now what's behind that statement as he goes on here? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now, what the devil, what Satan, the, the adversary, the term, the um, Hebrew term, Satan, Ha Satan, the adversary, what he's saying is that people don't love God just because of the beauty, glory, majesty, and holy holiness and spectacular magnificence of who he is. He's saying that to God. This guy, Job, this guy, Job, he doesn't fear you for nothing. He doesn't fear you because of who you are. He doesn't fear you and shun evil because you are holy and glorious and beautiful. He doesn't love you for the character of who you are and the beauty of who you are. He loves you for only one reason. Because of all the ways you've blessed him. You've given him a wife. Ten children. You've given him possessions. 
You've put a hedge of protection around him. You know what that means? You've surrounded him. You've made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You know what that means? Satan had been looking for a way in to destroy this guy. And he couldn't find one. God had surrounded Job with a hedge of protection everywhere. Satan hated Job. If you're a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to know that you have an enemy. You have an enemy in the devil and his demons. And the devil and his demons absolutely positively mock at and laugh at the people who think that they're not real. They do. Because they are. There is a personal devil and there is a whole phalanx of demonic hosts and forces out there. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and powers, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the dark places and the heavenly realms. And so we have to pray. The, the, the weapons of our warfare are not guns and grenades and tanks and um, an air force and military. It's rather the armor of God, the gospel, the grace of God, the salvation of God. That's the key. And those are the weapons of our warfare. The Satan had been looking for a way to destroy Job. He'd been wanting to kill this guy for a long time and to destroy his family, to kill his kids, take all of his possessions. Job wanted, or it's the, the devil wanted Job to curse God to his face. He wanted to prove that no one in this sinful world would ever just love God for who he is, for the glory of who he is, and for the beauty of who he is. So he says, does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you made a hedge around him? And Satan knew full well that God had, because he wanted to get past that hedge to go hurt him around his household Satan had tried to hurt his household couldn't around all that he has tried to hurt his possessions couldn't do it because there's a hedge around him you've blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land but now stretch out your hand touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face and it's an amazing thing Job as far as we know never finds out about this dialogue here he never finds out why all this calamity happened to him. And the Lord says, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. God removes that hedge of protection for one day. Um, everything I have will be gone. Everything I have will be gone. If God removes his protection from the devil, uh, everything I have will be lost. And what's amazing to me is that we are just as much obligated to worship, love, praise, obey, adore God on the day that we have our health, our possessions, our children, and our spouse, our family, friends, we're just as much obligated to love, worship, and obey God on that day as we are the day after that if we lose all of those things. And you know the narrative here, what goes on. There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came. The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped. He worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And... Satan wants another crack at it. 
And this time, he says, after having the same conversation, the same initial dialogue with the Lord about Job, skin for skin, he says in Job 2, verse 4, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life, but stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to, to your face. He says, okay, all right. Okay, God, you got me. Yeah, he's a pretty, he's a pretty tough cookie. Um, but let's take away his health. Let's let's touch his own flesh and let's see if he'll curse you then. So God tells him, "All right, go ahead, but spare his life." So Satan is going to bring as much physical pain and misery on Job as possible without killing him. Basically, is what happens here. He's going to bring as much suffering, as much pain onto him as possible without killing him. And it's awful. He's covered with the, the Hebrew term there is shekane, the boils. Same term used in the plagues uh, in Egypt, the plague where boils broke out on everybody from um, the dust. And uh, Job is covered with them from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. And then Job's friends come and they're not much comfort. They all sit there in silence for seven days and then Job is the first one to speak and he curses the day of his birth he says may the day perish on which I was born and the night in which it was said a male child is conceived and he goes on and on and on and Job doesn't understand he says in verse 11 of Job 3 why did I not die at birth why did I not perish when I came from the womb why did the knees receive me, or why the breast that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who built ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold who filled their houses with silver. For why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like infants who never saw light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest." He's saying, I wish I would have just died at birth. I wish, I wish I wouldn't have grown up to see all this trouble. And I wanted to share this from Job because I know that there's a lot of folks at church who are suffering. And a, a whole array of, of suffering. Um, there are folks dealing with physical suffering, with um, physical uh, ailments, illnesses. Um, issues and there's um, sadness related to uh, wayward children. There's sadness related to um, you know all kinds of things. We're concerned always about the salvation of all of our children. Our church has a ton of a ton of little children, <clears throat> born and unborn. There's there's more coming, <laughs> and we think about them and we we're concerned about them and we we have these burdens. And for a lot of folks, those burdens just never go away, and they're, they're very difficult. And I think a lot about um, my own tendency toward uh, spiritual laziness and not praying very hard. And it's been um, when my children have suffered that I've prayed the hardest, and or when I've seen other people's children suffer that I've prayed the hardest, or you see a heartache and you see weariness in the eyes of other folks at church, you pray really hard for them because you feel each other's pain. That's part of um, being part of the body of Christ is you, you shoulder one another's burdens and you feel one another's burdens and you pray for one another. But I want to encourage everyone to remember something. The devil asked that question. He, he mockingly asked that question. Does Job fear God for nothing? You stretch out your hand and touch what he has, and he will walk away from you, God. He will curse you to your face. He'll want nothing to do with you. He loves you only because you have blessed him so much. And that's a painful thing. It's a painful thing. Because everyone who's ever suffered in life has wondered, what did I do? What did I do? Have I made God angry about something? Is he disciplining me for something? And sometimes what we go through is is the disciplinary hand of God. Sometimes it is. 
but not always. And Job himself, if you read through all the, the dialogues here with his friends you know, Bildad, Zophar, and Eliphaz, they certainly think he must have done something wrong. And then later you get Elihu, uh, I think it's in Job 34 and following, Elihu comes along and throws his two cents worth in. But for the most part, for the most part, what Job's friends think is just plain wrong. But anyone who suffers, anyone who goes through real heartache and th things that, that really test us and really hurt us, where the way I've put it is uh, there are so many things in my life that there's kind of this unspoken thing between me and God where I've said, okay, God, you can go this far, but no further. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to take this from me. <laughs> this is too important. Why would you give me this? And then take it away from me. Why would you give me something so special, so important, that means so much to me, and then take it from me? That just seems cruel. But then you see here in Job, the fact of the matter is, the purpose for which we are here is not pleasure. And it's not for all of our dreams to come true. And it's not to create a perfect little life for us here. The purpose for which we exist is the glory of God. And he can glorify himself in whatever way he wants to do with us. And that's painful. That's hard to think about. I think, wow, what if, uh, what if God allowed all this kind of stuff to happen to me? What if he took all of my family? What if he took all ten of my kids away? What if, um, what if my whole family turned its back on God? What if my wife turned her back on God and told me to curse God and die and left me? I would still be obligated to worship him. Would I be able to do that? I I'm not going to answer that question. I do know that God is able. God would be able to carry me through that and carry people through those kinds of things. He did it here with, with Job. Job did not sin. He didn't yell at God or, what is going on? He, he didn't do any of that. He just said, I didn't come into the world with anything. Naked I came from my mother's womb. God gives, God takes away. We're simply stewards of what we do have. We're stewards of the time that we've been given. We're stewards of the gifts that we've been given. And whatever trials and tribulations and difficulties and losses that we're called upon to endure, um, that's what we're supposed to do. Now, it, it chills my blood to say that. <laughs> it does. Because there are things I know that would test me that would push me to the breaking point. There are things that have pushed me to the breaking point that my family has experienced. But I just want to encourage everybody that the trials and the, the, the heartache, the things that are, are so painful where we're made to feel like a failure um, by the people around us, by the people that we've tried the most not to let down, they make us feel like we've let them down. Or things that are the most important earthly things we have, the things for which we would give anything to protect. Something happens, something that is outside of our control, and we pray and pray and pray, and, and God doesn't answer us. When those things happen, we are still obligated to worship and praise God, to worship, praise, and love God. And... If we didn't have those trials, if we didn't have unanswered prayer, we would never learn perseverance. We would never learn perseverance. You know, when I, I was in high school, I was a, a mediocre football player on a team of superstars. I played on a, a team that was really great, and I was just a role player. I was a decent player, but I wasn't a star on that team. And Cincinnati, Ohio, where I, I grew up, is the city of extremes when it comes to weather. It's either freezing cold in the wintertime or it's 97 degrees every day and humid and there's ragweed and pollen in the air and you can't breathe. And we would do two a day football practices in the middle of August with all that equipment on. And what one thing that happened, um, a number of kids had had heat strokes or even died do it playing football, doing football practice. And so there was a rule put in place. We had to weigh ourselves before and after every practice. 
<clears throat> because you would sweat. I remember there was a kid that lost 14 pounds in one practice one time of sweat. And they'd make us run sprints with all that equipment on and make us do push-ups and sit-ups and run these sprints. And there's guys, you know, throwing up and, and like, passing out and everything. And the coach would always say the same thing. He would say to us, I know you guys hate me for making your run, and I know this is painful. But then he would say, you guys are going to feel like Superman on Friday night in the cool weather. And he was right. Suffering through the the heat of the day with all that equipment on. Friday night, 7.30 after the sunset in the fall, as the the earth was moving its way around the sun and we weren't getting hit so hard by the direct rays of the sun, you did. After suffering through all of that, those two-day practices and in the brutal heat and that cool weather, yeah, you felt like you could run forever and you felt uh, like Superman. He was right. You felt like you had all the energy in the world. But if he hadn't pushed us in the heat of the day, we wouldn't have been able to do that. We wouldn't have had the endurance that we did. And so these trials and the heartache and the sleepless nights and the pain that we endure and the, the losses that we experience and the often non-recoverable losses that we, that we face in life, that's there because God loves us and because he wants us to grow and he wants to increase our perseverance. He wants us to be able to, to feel like Superman on the, in the cool of Friday night. And without the, the furnace of affliction, um, our, our faith would be mixed with too much worldliness. Our faith would be mixed with too much dross and doubt and unbelief and too many silly attachments to sin and vain glory and wanting to be sort of worldly. And then kind of, it, it would be too mixed with things like that. And it's God's will that we move past that as, as his children. And the best way that he, he brings that to pass is through suffering. And suffering makes us like Christ because no one ever suffered more than he did. And we've been predestined to be conformed to his image. And so that's why we go through this stuff. But we're called upon to love God for who he is. He is the, the glorious one, the holy God, the one who created this remarkable world in all of its beauty and you know it seems like no matter where I sit on this porch the sun is hitting me right in the face but the sun rises over there and it's a beautiful thing to see uh, even though it, it, it's hard to find anywhere to sit on this porch where it's not hitting me um, but it's a beautiful thing I see the trees you hear the birds and you see the, the cow pasture over there and um, the God that made all this chose freely not to leave us in our sins and to give us everlasting hope and consolation and good hope by grace. And so the main thing that we need to remember always is that question Satan asked God. Does Job fear God for nothing? Okay, put your own name in there. Does so-and-so, do you fear God for nothing? Think about all the ways that God has blessed you in your life and all the, the gifts and blessings that he's given you. I think of my wife and my children and you know the fact that I, I'm relatively healthy. I haven't had any. You know, I've seen people younger than me who have experienced terrible um, health issues and, and problems, and it's it's painful to see it. It, it really is. It really is hard to see people suffer. I've I've never really had any any serious health issues. I, I just never have. Not not yet, at least. And I'm very thankful for that. Very thankful for that. But God could take my health away. You know, if He wanted to. So that's hitting me right in the, right in the face. There's one other passage. One other passage I wanted to read is our church is hopefully going to be entering into a season of very intense prayer, and I know that Satan himself is going to try to discourage and stop that. We're going to be doing a prayer meeting at five on Sunday evening before our evening service, and we want to pray for lost people, for people that are not Christians, for um, wayward children at our church, for our covenant children and for uh, lost family and friends and others that don't know the Lord. We want to do that as a church and we want to create a, a culture of heartfelt prayer for the lost. And this passage came to mind this morning as I was thinking about this. Ephesians 3 14 
and this is another one of these wonderful Trinitarian doxology passages. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So if we're strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, it's only the spirit of God doing it. We're strengthened by his spirit, not by ourselves, not by our resolve, but by him. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Think about Job. Did God love him? Did God love Job? Of course. Job knew about the Redeemer. I think it's in Job 18. I know that my Redeemer lives and that I shall see him stand on the earth. When this flesh is destroyed, these eyes shall see him and not another. Job knew all about the Messiah. God loved Job. Even when he tore his heart out with all that loss. When his wife said to him, curse God and die, you still hold fast to your integrity? Why? God obviously doesn't care about you, Job. Why do you hold fast to your integrity? Curse him and die. Remember Job's answer at the end of Job 2? You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we accept good from God and not also adversity? Job understood in the final analysis, yes, it was the Sabians and it was a, a strong east wind that had knocked down that house on all of his kids and that these raiders came and took all of his wealth and that he had th this disease now. He knew that in the final analysis, ultimately, that all came from God. Shall we accept only good from God? Shall we worship God only only when we have good and not adversity? When not Not when things go badly for us? Not when we're embarrassed when we sin or when we do things that are foolish and, and reap the consequences? Shall we only be thankful to God when things are for us and not against us? Now, eventually Job does mess up towards the end because he demands an audience with God. And God pounds him with questions in Job 38, 39. It's a pretty amazing array of questions. We are in no position to question the wisdom of God, although every part of us wants to. And I've had the terrible thought before, God, I'd be more useful to you. I could glorify you more if everything was perfect in my life and everything went the way I wanted it to and you always answered all my prayers in the way I wanted you to. Not the case. Verse 20 of um, Ephesians 3, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, According to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I love that passage. I think we pray with doubt. We pray not believing that God can really do what we ask. But he's able to do far above, exceedingly above what we ask or even think. According to that power that works within us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And it's interesting, the very next verse, <clears throat> in light of that truth, in light of that wonderful truth, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So in light of these truths about God and his ways with us, walk worthy of the calling. God is worthy that we worship him, obey him, glorify him, and speak well of him and think well of him, whether things are going well or things are going against us in life. And therein is the great challenge of the Christian life. When you become a believer in Jesus, life is going to be filled with joy, but it's also going to magnify your trials to a whole new level. Because God loves us and he will not allow us to show up on Friday night at the football game out of shape and not ready. 
not ready to, to play to win. And in order to do that, you got to suffer through weeks of two-day football practices in the 96-degree heat with all that equipment on, sweating, and the sweat's burning your eyes, and everything in your body is, is screaming to stop and go lay down in the shade or go jump in a swimming pool. But you, you persevere, and God won't let you stop. He's going to push and push and push you to make you better, to give us perseverance, to give us strength. And it's just like the sporting analogies and the training analogies that are used in Scripture. God pushes us to create that endurance, to create that perseverance within us. Does Job fear God for nothing? Do you and I fear God for nothing? God has, has blessed my life in so many ways. God has given me a, a beautiful wife. I love her dearly. She's wonderful. I've been so blessed by her. I, I tell people all the time, I, this is not an exaggeration, I married the best person I have ever met in my life. I got to marry the best human being I have ever met in my life. And we've been married for 24 years. And every single day, every single day that I've been married to her has been a gift from God to me. And I have blessed him for every day he has shared her with me. I don't deserve to have someone like that to be married to. I don't. And all 10 of my children, God has filled my heart with love for each of them. <clears throat> But <laughs> the, the sense of helplessness over the salvation of others is magnified a million fold when you have kids. Because there's nothing in the world like locking eyes with your own flesh and blood. And you can't save them. You cannot save them. And you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you beg God, and you lose weight because you don't eat because you're worried about this one or that one. They're all different. And God has given me rays of hope. One of my little ones came to me, and I'm not, I'm not going to get emotional about this, but it came to me the other, just uh, like three or four weeks ago. I want to take communion, Dad, my nine-year-old. And it's not that I'm suspicious, <clears throat> but I had asked this little guy again and again from the time he was little, share the gospel with the kids and you know, do you believe Jesus is your savior? Do you believe that he died for your sins? And he always said the same thing. Every single time I asked him that, he would say the same thing to me. He would say, I don't know how to. Son, do you believe in Jesus? You know, it says in Isaiah 53, 6, and the Lord has laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. Do you sin? Yes. You sin against God? Yes. You understand how serious that is? Oh, yes. And God sent his son into the world to die upon the cross. He's a perfect savior for sinners. Do you believe that he did that for you? I don't know how. I don't know how. And that's the, he, that's what he said all the time. And it, it really upset me. It really worried me. Um, because the other kids were always <clears throat> very like ready to say, oh yes, oh yes, 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 yes. I, I believe, I believe, I believe. But he wouldn't. Three weeks ago, sitting out there by the fire pit, right out there, he walks over to me. Dad, I want to take communion. And I said, why is that? Why do you want to? And I will never forget what he said. Just as clear as day, he said to me, he said, because I believe that Jesus Christ is God and that he died on the cross for my sins and I believe he is my savior. That's exactly what he said. <laughs> and I said, Okay. Wow. And in my heart, I'm just going, thank you, Lord, for that. I, I hope this is real. <clears throat> you still have doubt. You still wonder, does he really get it? Does he really understand? And I wasn't going to have him come make his profession, you know, that Sunday. I wanted to let it sit for a few more weeks. And it came up again and again. And it was just as strong, just as powerful. When he came before the session, just as strong there. And I, I see a change. I see a pronounced change. He's become more patient with his younger sisters. The kid's got three younger sisters. We tried our best to get him a younger brother, and it's just, you know, in God's providence, he had three more girls. That's fine. He's wonderful with them. And I, I've just been so delighted by it and so happy with that and just so encouraged by it. But you can't save him. You can't save 
your children, you can raise a dog. And, you know, it's just one of those things that it's the most helpless feeling on earth. <laughs> you want all your kids to go to heaven and you love them with all your heart. And you, you understand what Paul meant in Romans 9 when he said, I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brethren, the Israelites. Um, you feel that way about your kids uh, and about your loved ones, about family. Does Job fear God for nothing? I think God is asking that question of myself and of everybody when we go through the trials. And it's good to show the devil himself. I fear God because of who he is. Not because of the hedge of protection he's put around me and not because of the good gifts he's given me. But I fear God because of the beauty and the glory and the perfection and the majesty of who he is. And together as Christians, we need to pray for the salvation of the lost and we need to be thankful always that God would send his son into the world to suffer and die for us, to redeem us and to bring us to heaven. So thank you all for watching or for listening.